Welcome to this video lecture on scientific research in information systems. This video lecture is about research design. It will cover induction, deduction, and abduction as logical reasoning skills that feature in research designs. It will discuss research strategies, namely exploration, rationalization, validation that feature in research designs. It will discuss the different choices one has to make when building a research design different research methodologies that it could feature in research designs, and discuss the role of literature in the research design process. The main reading for this video lecture is Chapter 3, Planning a Research, from the book Scientific Research Information Systems, a Beginner's Guide, that is available for from Springer in its second edition in 2021 um, as a hard copy, soft copy, ebook, or most universities provide access to PDF copies of the individual chapters to spring a link. A URL is provided below. Research design is the process that we undergo to figure out how a study can answer a research question. Once a research question is specified, that's the next challenge, to craft a plan of action to answer the research question. And that is exactly what's called the research design. So it is a blueprint for the collection, measurement, analysis of data suited to answer the research question. And as such, it usually involves a combination of different reasoning skills, these being induction, deduction, and or abduction. These reasoning skills feature in different strategies, namely exploration, rationalization, validation, who could either be the focus or appear in combination in different research designs. We start by explaining induction, deduction, and abduction. Induction is a form of logical reasoning that involves inferring a general conclusion from a set of specific factual observation. We are moving from observing particulars and trying to derive more general premises from these. So we use it to develop and formulate tentative hypotheses and propositions that declare general conclusions or theories based on a limited set of observations. So we do use it to infer theoretical concept or patterns from observed data or, or known facts, and that way generate new knowledge by proceeding from particulars to generalities. As an example, consider that we can make observations about all life forms on the planet Earth, and all those that we have seen, and it could be millions, depend on liquid water to exist. From there, we can offer the induction that all life forms, including those that we have never seen or that we don't even know yet, will depend on liquid water to exist. The problem with induction is that the inductive argument itself can never be proven or justified through the induction. And moreover, inductive arguments can be weak or strong. The induction I always hang pictures on nails and therefore all pictures everywhere must always hang from nails is a weak induction probably because the observation is too limited or the generalization is too broad. Induction offers a useful pathway and a very well accepted pathway for constructing new theoretical explanation or hypothesis um, because these conclusions are offered based on educated predictions because we have some limited set of observations. So when I study a phenomenon in a limited set of cases, and I always in these sets of cases found a particular relationship or pattern to be at work, then I can develop the tentative proposition that this pattern Z is related to the phenomenon X in general in this or that way. An opposite sort of, so to speak, uh, reasoning strategy is called deduction. That's a form of logical reasoning that involves deriving arguments as logical consequences of a set of more general promises as predictions about a set of observations. So we deduce a prediction as a conclusion about a specific instance from a general premise. This is, um, we use deduction to develop predictions, expectations in the form of hypotheses or propositions. And in so doing, this is probably the most common approach to science. It's called the hypothetical deductive model. The theory is stated, treated as a premise, and we derive some not so obvious conclusions as hypotheses that offer our predictions about what is likely to occur. If this and this is true, then this and this should happen. And these hypotheses are then tested and revised if necessary by comparing it to empirical data in experiments or anywhere else. As an example, if we take the premise that all man, men are mortal and we observe that Socrates is a man, we can deduce that Socrates must be immortal. The problem with deduction is what is called soundness and validity. 
we can proceed in deduction logically sound, but still end up with invalid deduction, namely if the premise is incorrect. For example, if we say only quarterbacks eat steak and John eats a steak, therefore John must be a quarterback, this is logically correct, but still invalid because the premise only quarterbacks eat steak is wrong. Induction and deduction are both important um, to many scientific processes. Um, what is important to realize is that one is not better than the others. They both have their own advantages and disadvantages, and neither is sufficient or complete. And a third accepted way of reasoning is what is called abduction, the process of making sense of an observation by drawing inferences about the most possible or most likely explanation. Now, what is important is that abduction is not a logical it's not a process of logical inference or deduction. Instead, it's more like a trial error set for a satisfactory, a satisfactory explanation about an observe, observation after the fact. So we can call it educated informed guessing. We observe something and then we ask ourselves, what is the most likely explanation for what I just observed? And in so doing, it is a creative process more so than a logical process. It is an operation geared towards the creative discovery of entirely new ideas without being bounded by logical modes of thinking through justification or formal inference. Here's an example um, that shows you how you can reason about this similar set of phenomena in very different ways. And the phenomena here is um, um, beans and they have a particular color and they are in a bag or near a bag. Yeah? So beans in a bag. In induction, we would move as follows. We could make an observation like uh, the set of beans here are from these particular bags and the beans are all white, and then derive at the induction that all the beans from the bag are white, including those that we haven't seen. In, de in deduction, we would move from a premise to an observation. All the, the premise might be that all the beans in the bag are white. We make an, and then we predict basically that any beans taken from the back must be white. Yeah, so we move to an observation, a, a set of beans from the back, and deduce that the beans must be white. And that we could then test by looking at the beans. In abduction, um, we could have a rule such as the beans from the back are white, and we could have an observation, there's a bunch of beans and they are white and they're near the back, and therefore the most likely and most possible explanation is that the beans are probably from the back. So. I'm not arguing that these are good or you know valid scientific explanations here, but hopefully you can see how these forms of reasoning proceed in quite different ways. Why is this important? It's important because good research involves different strategies, namely exploration, rationalization, validation, and they involve induction, deduction, and abduction to a different extent. Um, in, in exploration, very often we use inductive reasoning strategies. We explore a phenomena and then maybe develop patterns or more general observations from the specific facts. In rationalization, we very often proceed abductively in that we search in rationalization for most likely or most plausible explanations. Validation, on the other hand, very often involves deduction, namely the development or derivation of a way of testing the predictions of a theory by comparing it against observation or other types of data. So exploration is the systematic discovery of things or phenomena. Rationalization is a sense-making process or a search for an explanation for the puzzle or problem. And validation is subjecting an emerging or existing theory to rigorous examination and testing. And now in research design, what we usually do is we can build research designs that are focused on either one end of this triangle or on the relationships. So the emphasis of any one study can be on exploration, rationalization, or validation, or some combination of them. So for example, there are studies that explore and rationalize. So they uh, study a new phenomenon and offer a first theory about it. There are studies that are only about validation. They take some theory presented by someone else and test it through experiments. Or sometimes we have studies that um, validate and explore. Yeah, error five here in my diagram. So that means they subject a theory to a test, discover that the theory is at least partially incorrect or incomplete, and then explore likely alternative explanations. So one other important note is that the combination of all these aspects, so all the ends and all the links, what is here I denoted as 0.7, 
is typically only achievable through research programs, which are logical sequences of multiple individual studies. Yeah, so a set of studies together can probably achieve all of that. What is important here is that the choice of emphasis in a research design um, is, of course, geared by your interests, where you want to contribute and how, and the availability of data to support exploration, validation, or rationalization. But it's also influenced by factors that are not in your own control, but rather given um, in the domain or in your field. So one of them is the maturity of the field with regards to phenomena. If you take a new and emergent phenomena, say ChatGPT, um, then very often in the beginning, much of the research is focused on exploration. We don't know, so let's go find out, describe and explore. Um, for example, with ChatGPT, we are not yet at the rationalization stage where we have a lot of theories available that would explain how and why ChatGPT um, would produce the type of consequences it does. Once we have that, we would naturally gravitate towards validation that more and more research efforts are spent on being testing these theories and you know, testing new predictions and so forth. Um, conversely, if you study a, a field or phenomenon that has been studied for a long time, say adoption of new technologies in the firm, that is something that has been studied for 30, 40 years, um, the field would likely see very few new exploration. We've been explored it for a while and we do have a lot of rationalizations, different theories available to explain it. So naturally, the starting point would be some combination of validation, perhaps with exploration. Um, finally, different fields um, have an emphasis on different research methods and different research methods support either one of these different spectrums, usually not all of them. Um, so, for example, in psychology, uh, a lot of emphasis is given on behavioral experiments and behavioral experiments are very good for validation, not very good for exploration. In IS, in information systems, we have the fortunate situation that it's a pluralistic field where many, many different methods are accepted, meaning that you can basically freely choose between exploration, rationalization, and validation. Um, and to, to illustrate that, I brought an example from my own PhD research program many years ago, which was around um, process modeling grammars. And my research design in this program, in this PhD program, featured many different elements. So for example, this particular study was an exploration study where I described what companies were doing with this particular grammar and the standard and just seeing what, what sort of issues they ran into. This is not a rationalization study. There's no validation, purely exploration. Um, study, what is now here, number three, um, based on the diagram, the triangle diagram that I showed you above, this is a validation study. This takes an existing theory and subjects it to a test um, using new collected data. Number five here is a study that moves between validation and exploration. This is a, a study that took as a starting point a theory, ex, you know, uh, subjected it to empirical test and explored um, alternative explanation because the testing showed that not all of the predictions of the theory were in fact faithful. They were not correct, so to speak. And finally, and as an example for the research program, this entire body of work, the different studies and so forth, actually at some stage were published as a book. And this book in a way describes the entire research program throughout the different stages and the different types of studies. The next step is choosing a research design. And here, one way of thinking about choosing a research design is to think about a multidimensional space that is made up of a continuum between different ends. And these ends are being determined by your research question. So the, re the key benchmark against which your research design must be aligned is the research question, the specification of the problem. So the research design must logically match the question not the other way around. You cannot start with a particular way of setting up a study and then find a question that suits it. You should start from the question and then figure out the best way of matching a research design to that question. For example, if your research question is more of a type one type of question around exploration description, then perhaps a research design featuring exploration, case boundaries, qualitative methods in the field is more suited than a laboratory uh, predictive type of study using quantitative data. 
There's different considerations that are important when choosing a research design. One consideration is data. What type of data is available and what type of data is required to answer the research question? And is there a match between availability and requirements? So the question is, how do I sample data? Where from? Where can I collect the observation? And is the type of data that I can collect matching the, question, the data that would ideally be suited to answering the research question? To illustrate, consider that you want to study strategic decision making by technology executives. Um, that's a relevant question. That's an important question. It's a question where we don't have a lot of research. Um, and the best type of data, I guess, would be from strategic decision makers in firms, ideally from many firms. So many, many CIOs. Now, the point with CIOs is, of course, that they're very hard to get. They're um, difficult to identify. They're difficult to access. They have limited time available. And for example, it would be very difficult to get a bunch of CIOs and put them in an experiment. If at all, you might be able to get a few interviews with a few of them, and then probably only one time. So here, the research question around strategic decision making might not actually, and the data that would be required, might not be the data that you will be willing or able to get. The second consideration are risks. What are the dangers associated with the execution of your research design? Some research design are more controllable than others or are more in your control versus more outside of your control. For example, if you do a research design around experimentation in laboratories, so in rooms, for in labs provided by the university, you're more in control about what is to happen and who participates and so forth than when you do field research with organizations uh, and businesses. Businesses are fickle in the sense that they may promise to participate, but then they become unavailable. The person that is your key contact may leave the company or be on holiday or the strategic priorities change and the initiative is no longer relevant to the company. So these risks do exist in research design and good research designs provide some sort of strategies to minimize or mitigate these risks. For example, maybe you can sample multiple cases and that alleviates the problem that one of the cases might drop out. Or you can choose a multi-method strategy so that the risks of one method might be up, uh, offset by advantages of a, of a second method. A third consideration is a theory. So the question how much literature concerning the phenomenon of interest is available and what that literature actually says. For example, is no literature available about a phenomenon versus there's a lot of literature available. Do we have one theory of a dominant that explains the phenomenon of interest or are there perhaps competing theories that give you alternative and non-incompatible um, theories? If so, that would influence your research design. For example, in a field where you have two or more competing theories that all offer an explanation about a a phenomenon, but that are incommensurable, so they're not compatible, then a research design should have a way of determining which of the theories is correct and which of them should be refuted or disproved. For example, an experimentation could, could allow you to do that, a test of competing theories. A fourth consideration is feasibility. How likely or possible will it, is it to execute your research design within the constraint associated with your project, your study, your time, your resource limitation, funding, geographic boundaries, experience, and so forth. Um, for example, in Europe, it may not be the best idea to study technology adoption in South America, Antarctica, or, or East Asia because it's very far away. Um, one particular aspect here is the guidance that is available to you in your study. So your supervisory or advisory team, the professors that help you, for example, do they give you, do they have the expertise and capability required to execute the research design with those methods that you want to do? A fifth consideration is instrumentation. So the question of how you, the concepts of interest that describe the real world phenomena that you, that you want to study, how do they manifest in reality? How can, can they be measured and how can they be measured? For example, if you were studying the performance of a firm, then it's very likely that you will choose a quantitative research design because performance data is available in very quantifiable objective terms, you know, through uh, loss and income statements, revenue statements, 
um, stock market performance, stuff like this. And it would be a, a poor choice to study the, or measure the performance of a firm through qualitative ways, for example, through whatever people tell you or other types of reports or how people feel or perceive the performance of a firm. So here, um, there could be a mismatch between how concept manifest in reality versus how you consider operationalizing them and using them within the research design that you set out. So the question is whether the operationalization measurements that are available or that are dominant in reality, will they be appropriate given the research question, the, the data and the research design that you choose? The next aspect we need to consider is what's called the research methodology. This is probably the most critical choice to be made in research design. The research methodology specifies the procedures for data collection and analysis carried out in a research study. So this is the, it concerns the question of how are we going to get evidence to rationalize, to explore, or to validate whatever we're trying to do. There are basically five main types to consider. Quantitative methods, qualitative methods, design science methods, computational methods, or a combination of the, uh, these methods, which are called mixed methods. Quantitative methods describe research procedures, such as experiments or surveys that are characterized by an emphasis on quantitative data. So these procedures have a focus on numbers, so to speak. That means in these procedures, we approach phenomena by gathering quantifiable evidence about them and rely on the statistical analysis on this quantifiable numerical evidence to generate valid, reliable, general claims and ideally about across many cases or different experimental groups. So this emphasis on quantitative data means, of course, that we collect data about quantities of something and the numbers are meant to represent, represent values or levels of constructs and concepts. To give you an example, in quantitative methods, we would think about a concept such as, such as happiness as a number on a scale from very unhappy to absolutely delighted where very unhappy could be number one and uh, very delighted could be a number 10. And then we could relate these numbers and the, the, the value that they represent. Yeah. So a six is twice as much as a level three happiness um, to some other quantifiable evidence, such as our satisfaction with studying or our satisfaction with our life or God knows what else. The most popular methods that are in the quantitative methodology are experiments, either in the lab, so in a laboratory, for example, a room of a university, or in the field, that is within the real life context where the phenomenon is happening. Very often in information systems, this could be um, a, an experiment with the website design choices of an e-commerce platform, say, or the interface design choices of an application, you know, for ride sharing or anything like that. A third option, and actually the most popular ones, are surveys, so structured questionnaires where we give people questions where the answer options are numerical scales, such as your level of agreement from one to seven or your you know, percentage from one to zero to 100 or stuff like this. A fourth option are simulations, which are statistical analysis of synthetically created data that we manipulate to see how a complex phenomenon behaves or you know changes such as you know a market competition or uh, you know a multitude of agents behaving in a particular way qualitative methods stand in contrast to quantitative methods um, these are methods such as case study ethnography or phenomenology that are characterized by an emphasis on qualitative data so they have a focus on words or anything but numbers, you know, words mainly, but it could also be images, observations, or videos. They, instead of ha um, favoring general claims in numerical precise evidence, they emphasize contextual subjective understanding, contextualized, rich, and subjective understanding of phenomena through direct observations, communication with involved participants, te or text analysis. So, what is unique about qualitative methods that they're typically or always in the real life context where the phenomena occurs. So if we do qualitative methods, we go into the field to the side where the phenomena occurs that could be within inside a firm or into a social group or into a collective. They're very helpful when the boundaries between phenomena and context are not apparent. 
or when we don't know much about a phenomenon, we want to study it in depth. And as such, they're very helpful for exploration and rationalization type of research strategies because they allow us to grab a rich, contextualized, holistic understanding of a phenomenon and understand what it is, what it looks like, how we might think about it, and so forth. It is less suited for validation because validation um, favors precise measurement that we could much better obtain through quantitative methods. They're also ideal for studying social, cultural, or political, or otherwise hard uh, aspects of a phenomena that are hard or difficult to quantify. The most popular methods in IS that we will cover are case studies, so study of cases where something interesting is going on, grounded theories, ethnographies, so um, immersive situated observations, or interviews, and we will cover all of these. A third set of methods are what are called design science methods. These are research procedures that have an emphasis on building and evaluating novel and innovative artifacts. You can think of algorithms, procedures, methods, or applications that are as outcomes of the research process. And we have an emphasis here on the construction of the artifact and the demonstration of its utility. So these procedures don't have a focus on number of words necessarily, but they do have a focus on artifacts. This is a very unique or type of research paradigm because we are not uh, proceeding empirically necessarily, but we want to create a new artifact. So we are designers in a sense, and the creation of the artifact is the way through which we are contributing new knowledge to the body of scientific evidence. These artifacts are meant to be useful and fundamental. The basis to design science research is the fact that information systems is unique in that it is both a social science and an artificial science, so a science of human-created, artificially constructed instead of naturally occurring objects. And in design science, the interest is thus on how are these artifacts created and how can they be designed and changed so that they can improve on an existing solution to problem or perhaps provide a first solution to a new problem. Um, and so it goes back directly to these ideas of, of Herbert Simon. Um, it considers different types of artifacts, so these could range from new languages or vocabularies to models and frameworks, methods and processes, algorithms or prototypes, or even complete systems, softwares or applications, or complete design theories um, at a very abstract level. A fourth type of method are what are called computational methods. This is an emerging type of methodology. Um, these are procedures that involve the use of digital software tools for research activities, such as data generation, data processing, data analysis, data uh, pattern matching, data discovery, or interpretation. So computational methods that rely on algorithms um, in the software to support, augment, or automate otherwise manual activities and they rely on digital trace data as their input. So digital trace data means evidence of activities and events that are logged and stored digitally online. You can think of cookies, click streams, um, commentaries, content, stuff like that. Um, one example here um, is a study by Brian Pentland, Emma Vast, Julie Ryan Wolf, who used electronic medical record data from 57,000 patient visits to four dermatology clinics at the University of Rochester over the course of a year. And they noticed algorithmically, through algorithmic um, analysis, they figure uh, they identify changes, dynamics, and, and certain patterns in this data, and they could reason about what was going on during these patient visits. And the point of this example is to show you how computational methods really expand the scope of human research activity beyond the limit of what would otherwise be humanly possible. So, for example, you can't follow 57,000 patient visits over a year across four clinics manually. It's, it's next to impossible to do manually. Um, these types of tools, they are different. They're different kinds of tools. And one way to think about it is by differentiating augmentation from automation tools. So some software exists that carries out algorithmically certain research steps, data generation, process analysis, basically autonomously. So with little to no human intervention or oversight, text mining tools, sentiment analysis tools, pattern recognition through machine learning, or in fact, ChatGPT, who generates outputs autonomously 
um, in response to a prompt or a query, that would be an example of automation tools. Conversely, there are also augmentation tools, so research software that complements and amplifies but not supplants human activity. Latent semantic analysis software is such an example. That is software that allows uh, you to parse and interpret large bodies of text, so really thousands and thousands of documents. But the eventual interpretation of that content of the latent semantics in that text is still up for a human to process. Finally, a fifth choice in methodology would be what are called mixed methods. So these are procedures that are combinations of different individual methods in either sequential, so one after another, or concurrent fashion, so in parallel. Traditionally, mixed methods usually involve a quantitative and qualitative strategy, for example, a survey with a case study or an experiment together with interviews. Um, but more recently, we've also seen a mixing of design methods with qualitative or quantitative methods, um, the mixing of different computational methods or the mixing of computational methods with quantitative or qualitative methods. We mix methods for different purposes. Um, and just to mention two of them, the most common one is what's called triangulation. Triangulation basically means that you use different methods to study one phenomenon and you hope for the same insights. So a convergence of results from multiple methods, because that way you can show that these insights that you generate are really robust. A very different purpose would be one of complementarity, where you take one method to elaborate, enhance and illustrate and clarify the results that you obtain from another method. An example would be here that you run an experiment and you get unexpected numerical results. And then you use an interview with experiment participants to figure out what was really going on and to seek an alternative explanation. This is a graph that shows you which of these methods are popular or more widely used than others. It doesn't include mixed methods, but suffice to say that mixed methods would be a niche. So they would be somewhere at the bottom of this graph. Uh, and a simple reason is that they're very hard. It's very very hard to do. You need to do multiple things, you know, at the same time for one study. Uh, quantitative methods are the dominant paradigm. That's common to most fields. Um, but qualitative methods are also very accepted and very widely used, as you can see here. Computational methods have been on the rise since about 2015. You see an upward trend here. Um, and one of the main reasons is that we've only had such software available for a couple of years. And also we didn't have a lot of digital trace data, let's say prior to 2010 or so. Design science finally is an established and accepted genre, but it's, it's niche. It's about 5% uh, if that of a research activity in the field, which is more than in other fields, but of, it's still not as mainstream as some of the other. A final aspect to consider about these methodologies is that they have different strengths and weaknesses, and these strengths and weaknesses may match to certain requirements that are imposed for by your research question or some of the constraints that are around you. For example, if um, controllability is a very important consideration in for your research question, then clearly qualitative strategies are not uh, the most suitable option because typically we have very low control over what is going on in a case setting or in a field where we don't have control over the phenomenon. Whereas in a, in a survey, we have relatively high control. In a laboratory, we have very high control. And in design science, we have extremely high control because it is us who are building the artifacts, of course. Um, explorability, on the other hand, is uh, very difficult to do with design science. You're building artifacts. It's also very difficult to do in an experiment because the key point of an experiment is to isolate a one or two factors that could cause a particular phenomenon to occur. And in qualitative strategies, they give us a lot more leeway to explore all sorts of perspectives and sites and aspects of, an, of a phenomenon. So here, you can see a number of these different requirements from the ability to handle complexity, to the ability to generalize, to the ability to repeat procedures, or the ability to deduce new insights or to deduce um, inferences beyond the context of your study. And here you can see that typically these different methodologies have different strengths and weaknesses. And this is not by happenstance, this is by design. So these methods have been designed to offset 
um, the characteristics of other types of method. It also shows you that none of them is better or worse than any of the ones. They're more or less suited to different types of purposes. The final aspect in choosing a research design that we want to discuss here is the role of literature. Broadly speaking, there are three types of knowledge relevant at the stage of a research process where we are designing the research study. First, knowledge about the domain and the topic of interest. Second, knowledge about relevant theories and available evidence. And third, knowledge about different relevant methods that you can apply to develop new knowledge, build artifacts or articulate new questions. So irrespective of what you are doing, you, you hopefully see here that you need a lot of knowledge already at the stage of doing a research design. It is important to understand what as much as possible about the domain and phenomenon. It is important to understand how much literature we already have available and what that literature actually says. And thirdly, you need to know a lot of methodological knowledge about the different types of procedures you might want to or should or could carry out. What does it mean? This means even when you're planning the research very early on, knowing the literature is really, really important. It informs the extent, type and nature of your potential research problem. It tells you where we have gaps of knowledge or where other problems with the exit knowledge exist, such as false assumption, inconclusiveness, competing theories, inconsistencies, stuff like this. It also tells you the extent to which the current theories can adequately explain the particularities of a new phenomenon or an existing phenomenon and where they fail to do so. Also in the literature is where we have the knowledge about strategies and methodologies that have been used to research the same phenomena or similar phenomena, and it contains theories that you can use to help you frame your investigation, right? And similar, of course, it has all the knowledge about how to do research to begin with. So the key point here is that at this stage, you need to read, which is why in the beginning of a doctoral program or in your future, this research, you need to start reading. Reading is a key skill in, in research because this is the only way we can stay up to date with understanding what is that body of knowledge that we're always referring to. The body of knowledge is in written texts, and so your job will always inevitably be to understand and read that body of text. Um, there are a number of resources that can help you, of course. Yeah? So, for example, there are different online resources and information systems that sort of summarize the state of the knowledge about different methodologies. So for example, there's a web page for qualitative methods, there's a web page for quantitative methods, and there's a web page for design science methods. There's no dedicated online resource yet for mixed methods or for computational methods, but that could be a very useful thing to develop in the future. Finally, there is also, there is also a, um, online resources about theories that have been used before and that could inform um, certain approaches or literature that kind of inform your study as well. And that's um, all there is to take about literature in the research design process. So in this video lecture, overall, we talked about the role of induction, deduction and abduction to research design, strategies of exploration, rationalization, validation, research design choices and important considerations, different methodologies, and the role of literature. Thank you for listening, and thank you for watching.